Okay, so hi everyone, I guess I'll get started. Um, my name is Michaela Zuma. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Ottawa in Dr. Jeanne Alpin's lab and co-supervised by Dr. Pierre Keyes. And today I'll be talking to you about how shared genetic architecture and sex-specific selection may be shaping the evolution of relatively deeply forktail in a highly aerial bird, the alpine swift. And so first, just a little bit of general context, and so please bear with me here. Um, sexual dimorphism just refers to differences in the mean value of a trait between males and females of a given species. It is incredibly widespread, potentially explaining why we're still so interested in it today. <coughs> Never mind, I started early. Okay. Um, and there are a bunch of examples that we can find throughout the animal kingdom. So here's the cichlid fish, Lampolygus filipteris, where males are an impressive 12 times larger than females. Um, in terms of reverse sexual size dimorphism, female bald eagles are 25% larger than males. But stepping away from overall differences in body size, we also have examples like the impressive antlers of male elk, with females not producing antlers at all. And so these differences and many others are expected to reflect adaptive differences in the sex-specific optimum of the trait, and often arise as a result of sexual selection. However, sexual selection can also result in subtle sexual dimorphisms or an absence of dimorphism entirely. So here we can talk about the blue tit, for instance, where there are several subtle differences in plumage coloration, including in the UV spectrum, with birds being able to perceive the UV despite humans not being able to. We also have examples of more elaborate ornamentation being present in both sexes, as is the case in the king penguin, uh, with those really pretty orange patches of feathers on, and on their beak uh, being present in both sexes. And so there are a number of hypotheses put forth to explain these cases of uh, subtle sexual dimorphism or even monomorphism in the case of ornaments present in both sexes, one of which being the cross-section genetic correlation hypothesis. And so here, if we're talking about a shared trait, so a trait that is expressed in both sexes, we have on the y-axis the male trait, on the x-axis the female trait, and because individuals of a gonochoric species are only ever male or female, we can estimate this correlation as being between mothers and their sons and fathers and their daughters. So here, if we're talking about plumage brightness, we're gonna have really bright uh, feathered males producing bright feathered daughters, vice versa with bright mothers producing bright sons. Um, and so it's fairly intuitive then to assume that in some cases you can have a signaling trait in one sex that is also expressed in the other sex purely because they share so much of the same genetic architecture. Then there's also mutual selection where, as in the king penguin, that trait does serve a signaling purpose in both sexes. So here we know that those uh, bright orange patches correlate with different aspects of individual condition in both males and females, so body condition, immunocompetence, among others. Um, and they are used in mate choice for both males and females. And so mutual selection is expected to occur most often in monogamous species with biparental care. Yet another example of uh, secondary sexual traits that vary widely in terms of their dimorphism are deeply forked tails of birds. So here we can see clearly that V-shaped tail, which is present in both sexes of the barn swallow here, um, but male tails are elongated further than those of females, resulting in a deeper V. And so the bulk of research has been done on this trait in the barn swallow, uh, with it being considered a classical example of sexual selection. But it is a continuum, so we also have forked tails being expressed with subtle sexual dimorphism, as is, spoilers, the case in swifts. Um, but then we also have cases with the uh, sparkling-tailed hummingbird, where males have deeply forked tails, but females have rather a wedge-shaped tail. And so the bulk of, of research has been done on cases with more pronounced sexual dimorphism, either like the swallow, where the trait is present in both sexes, but differs in its elaboration, <laughs> um, or where you have the trait expressed in one sex but not really the other. And so that's left a um, gap in our understanding of what's going on in subtly dimorphic species. Which brings us to the research question of our study. Um, and so we had three. Firstly, we were interested in understanding if in a species with subtle sexual dimorphism there would be sex-specific selection on the fork line reflecting differences in the cost and benefit of the traits for both sex, and the, the traits, sorry. Uh, we also wanted to understand if fork length was a heritable trait in both sexes, suggesting that it would have the potential to evolve. 
Um, and finally, we wanted to understand if there were genetic constraints acting on this uh, trait um, estimated by the cross-section and a correlation. And to answer these questions, we are working with the lovely alpine swift, which is this bird over here. Uh, they are relatively long-lived and highly aerial, meaning they spend over six months of the year entirely in the air. So they will eat while flying, drink while flying, sleep while flying, and they really only land during the breeding period. So that's why most of our photos look like this with that beautiful backdrop of sky. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they only really land during the breeding season from May to August. And uh, the, col the colonies that we follow uh, breed in Switzerland in urban environments. So they, uh, this building is a church in Beale and it hosts one colony in the roof space. And so we've been tracking these colonies at the individual level for over 20 years now. And so just what that means is we go throughout the breeding season to monitor uh, the population size, which individuals are laying in which nests, and how many offspring are being produced. Um, and so here's what the chicks look like when they're freshly hatched. They look like alien jelly beans, but I think they're adorable. And also what they look like at about 45 days, when they start to look like ad adults, just with shorter tails and uh, wings. And because we've been tracking them for so long, we very importantly have access to a detailed social pedigree, which is essential for quantitative genetics. Um, and our pedigree is five generations deep and includes data on over 1,000 individuals. And like I said, there are subtle or cryptic sexual dimorphisms present in this species. For fork length specifically, the fork length is about 7% longer in males than in females. Um, and so just to be really clear about what I'm referring to with fork length. Uh, in yellow is the inner tail feather, in blue the outer tail feather, and so we just measure fork length as a difference between the tips of those two feathers when they're folded over one another. And so we measure that on both the rights and left sides of the body and then average it. So for our first research question, which was on the sex-specific selection, we used linear and generalized linear mixed effect models looking at a bunch of different uh, fitness components. And I'll only present the results from those on egg volume and the weighted proportion of surviving fledglings. So in terms of selection on egg volume, we found uh, directional selection on females, but not on males. So females with longer forks produce heavier eggs, um, which suggests a uh, increased primary investment on the part of those females. And it was actually a little bit surprising because previous studies have actually identified the result, uh, the, sorry, the opposite result, and uh, suggested rather a cost of deeply forked tails in females, which does not appear to be the case for the Alpine Swift. In terms of surviving fledglings, we found directional selection on males, but not females. So males with longer forks produce more surviving fledglings than those with shorter forks suggesting now a potential increased in investment in secondary reproduction from those males in that they might be providing better parental care, um, but we, we need to look into that some more. For our second and third research questions, we used the animal model, um, which for anyone unfamiliar is just a mixed effect model with the inclusion of pedigree data so that we can decompose phenotypic variation between environmental and genetic sources. And so we found that fork length was, uh, the added genetic variance and heritability of fork length was actually fairly high for males and likewise fairly high for females. Um, so the heritability is about 0.6, which is not unexpected from a morphological trait such as this. And at first glance, the added genetic variance does appear a little higher in females in black than in males um, in yellow, but uh, this difference is not statistically significant. So what that means is that Fork length is heritable in both sexes. It has the potential to respond to selection and evolve, and uh, we would expect it to evolve at the same rate in both sexes. We did find a strong positive cross-section out of correlation, uh, which approached one, which suggests that these sexes share much of the same genetic architecture for this trait. Um, and so just to break down that graph a little bit, it is very similar to the one I showed in my introduction. But we have on the y-axis the male fork length, on the x-axis, the female fork length. And in black, we are looking at the correlation between mothers and their sons. And in orange, the correlation between fathers and their daughters. So in both cases, it is a very strong correlation. Okay, and so just to wrap up really quickly, we found that fork length was directly selected in females in regards to the egg volume and in males in response to the surviving fledglings, which suggests that this trait has the potential to be mutually selected 
um, and potentially points to the fact that the overall costs and benefits of this trait differ between the sexes, although we do need to do some more work there. We also found that fork length was heritable in both sexes and that it was strongly positively correlated at the genetic level. And so taken together, that leads us to believe that the sexes should follow similar evolutionary trajectories um, with sexual dimorphism being maintained and fork length potentially increasing over time to reach that optimum, which seems like a somewhat trivial conclusion, but it's not what we observe at the phenotypic level. Um, over the last two decades, uh, sexual dimorphism in fork length has actually decreased by about 20%, um, which is explained by an increase in female fork length with male fork length remaining relatively stable. And this is somewhat puzzling and our next, next study to try to understand this, so I don't have an answer yet. Uh, but yeah, so the take home from our study is that fork length has the potential to be mutually selected, um, but genetic constraints are unlikely to explain the observed phenotypic changes. And so to understand that kind of mismatch, what we're trying to look at next is gonna be potentially cryptic evolution. So the fact that something in the environment may have changed to either accelerate um, selection on evolution on, on uh, female fork length by reinforcing that selection or counter selecting um, males. And it's also possible that uh, the genetic values of this trait have changed over time, so we also want to look into uh, the microevolutionary trajectory of this trait. That's it. Thank you very much um, for your attention and for everyone that made this research possible. And I know it talked a little fast, so I have time for questions if anyone has any. Yeah, so uh, in, not in, these stu in, uh, in the results that I showed, but I do also do a second set of analyses where I included wing length, which is a proxy for, bod for body size, um, and the results are very comparable. Possibly. Um, I, I really don't know too much about that yet, um, but it, like definitely the net, one of the other things I'd like to do is look at like um, the genetic correlation between traits too and also how that changes. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, so we, we used a, a large number of different fitness proxies and different fitness components. Um, so we, we've looked at um, Lang Day, which is not a fitness um, component per se, but is strongly correlated with, uh, with fitness in the species, um, and all the, the primary yearly results. So yeah, I think what you're getting at is in terms of looking at lifetime reproductive yeah. success, um, which we actually could do and would be a next step. We just, we haven't done that yet. And I guess I will let the next person come up then. Okay, hi, good morning everyone. Um, thanks for coming along. I'm Will Allen from Swansea University in Wales. Uh, I'm here to talk about a global collaborative research effort aimed at understanding the evolution of camouflage and apisemitism as anti-predator strategies. So camouflage aims to reduce uh, predation by avoiding detection or recognition, whereas warning color advertises uh, the defenses of prey either honestly, in which case we call it an apismatic strategy, uh, or dishonestly, for example, in Batesian mimics. And while some animals have evolved clever ways of being both apismatic and cryptic at different times or places, in general, directional selection on conspicuousness means that these are alternative anti-predator strategies. So here we ask, uh, why might apisemitism or camouflage evolve in different circumstances? 
We can think of this as a scale where various different selection pressures might lead to an advantage for an aposematic strategy versus a cryptic strategy. So, for example, in terms of the visual environment, uh, cryptic prey, camouflage prey, rely on not being seen, so they might be advantaged in places where it's easier to be less conspicuous, for example, dimmer light environments, whereas ap apsomatic strategies rely on their signals being seen and learnt and easily remembered, so they might do better where they're inherently more conspicuous or in bright light environments where things tend to be more visible. Prey community colour is also thought to be an important selection pressure on, on, on anti-predator strategy. So where other apismatic and warning coloured signals are common, we expect predators to generalise from the other signals in the community, providing protection to novel apismatic signals. Whereas for camouflage prey, we expect negative frequency dependence. If other camouflage prey are common, we predators will be looking for camouflage things and so be able to find them better, for example, through the use of search images. Finally, we can think about all the roles that the predator community might have on uh, se the selective advantage of each of these two strategies. So, for example, in resource seasonality, which drives how many naive predators there might be in a predator community at any one time, could be important. Uh, predator traits, such as how specialized they are at overcoming either the defenses of aposematic or camouflage prey might be important. The diversity of predators, so does a predator community contain a rich array of predators, some of them good at finding aposematic prey, some of them good at finding cryptic prey. And then predator competition as well, where, for example, we might expect in highly competitive predator communities, uh, predators having to sample warning coloured prey to find a meal, uh, but also likely encountering warning coloured prey less often per predator, slowing rates of learning for, for, for warning colour prey, which should ultimately advantage an aposematic strategy that's able to hang around for a bit longer and educate the predator community. All of these predictions have come out of theoretical work and several lab-based experiments, as well as field experiments on small or local scales, testing one or two, two of these potential selection pressures in isolation. What hasn't been done and what we aim to do here is to try and consider them all together at a global scale. So we formed a network of researchers which conducted a globally distributed experiment uh, performing an identical uh, protocol in 21 forests on six different continents. The experimental design is a well-established paradigm in the field of anti-predator coloration. We made paper moths attach mealworm rewards to them and pin them to trees and woods and left them exposed to avian predation. Over a certain number of days, eight days, we examined predation rates on three treatments. A cryptic treatment, a uh, treatment with typical black-orange warning coloration, and then to try and disentangle the effects of signal generalization and conspicuousness, uh, an atypical but equally conspicuous green-blue uh, warning colour treatment as well. We tested these with palatable mealworms because a site experiment showed that predation rates on unpalatable prey are extremely low and several of our predictions involve investigating changes in predation rates uh, over the eight days of experimental blocks. Uh, so we tested palatable prey and are able to infer responses to aposematic defended prey via changes in predation rates over time. We came up with a whole host of uh, ways of measuring some of the predicted ecological uh, um, drivers of, of aposematism or warning coloration. For example, analyzing the, uh, taking about 10,000 images and analyzing the conspicuousness of prey in them uh, and the light environment. Uh, and then measuring predator competition through uh, standardized avian field surveys at each location uh, and predation rates on a, on a mealworm-only block where there was no artificial prey. 
Across the whole experiment, we observed about 3,500 uh, avian attacks on prey, and there was no best treatment, as you might expect, if the warning treatment wasn't functioning as, 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 as a warning uh, and was just more conspicuous. So this enabled us to, to investigate the several ways in, in, in which our ecological predictors investigated in, influenced uh, predation rates. So here we can see the results of what had the biggest effect on, on treatment predation through, throughout our experiment, the, the degree of predator competition in a community. So in high predation communities, uh, you can see the orange line, the typical warning color treatment, was attacked to about 50% higher rate at the very beginning of the experiment, uh, as you would expect if predators are sampling warning color prey because they have to find the meal. But then, as predicted, the learning rate through, throughout the experiment uh, was slower than for the, for the, for the other treatments. So uh, for our undefended prey, this is a pretty um, a good thing. But if you translated this result to defended aposematic prey, it would be a pretty bad situation. Novel prey would be picked off early, and predators would be slow to learn that they're ever defended. Uh, in terms of prey community color, which we uh, assessed through categorizing the color of GBIF records of other Lepidopteran species that are to each, at each location, we, support, we found good support for what's already a fairly well-established result in, 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 in this area of the negative frequency dependence of, of cryptic colors, uh, the learning rate of predators increased rapidly through time where cryptic, alternate cryptic prey were common. Uh, and what would be the positive frequency dependence of aposematic strategies. So our undefended uh, warning color, typical warning color prey were, were learned rapidly, uh, which would facilitate learning of aposematic defended prey uh, as well. Um, moving on to the results for, 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 for light environments. So the levels of illumination in the environment uh, didn't affect predation on the typical warning color prey uh, at all. Uh, this is what you might expect given what's thought to be the relative perceptual stability of oranges and reds uh, across different light environments, which is the leading explanation for why so many warning colors uh, are orange. Whereas for the cryptic prey, there was an interesting and, and partly unexpected result. So, uh, in high illumination environments, initially, cryptic prey were found much more easily as, 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 and predated more, as you might expect if uh, uh, high illumination just makes things a little bit easier to find. But the learning rate was pretty flat over the course of, 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 the, of the experiment. We think this might have to do with, in bright forest environments, they're typically characterized by dappled light and moving branches, which are going to change the appearance of that cryptic strategy uh, those cryptic prey through time uh, and make it harder to learn for the predator community what cryptic prey they're looking for in that, in, in, in that situation. Uh, finally, the results for, for target salience uh, replicated what's, what's, what's well established. Uh, warning colors work better when they're more salient. Uh, but interestingly, the camouflage strategy didn't overall work better when it was less salient. In fact, what was really important was the rate of change on the camouflage prey when they were more salient. So predators were faster to learn more salient camouflage prey, which is sort of really emphasizing some, some uh, recent results in the literature that emphasize the importance of uh, high quality camouflage for resisting predator learning. So putting all this together, we found good support in a, in a fairly ecologically realistic uh, field experiment for several predictions that come from theory or, or, or lab-based experiments. Uh, in general, find, find, finding support for, for what we expected to find, but also characterizing the way multiple selection pressures act on uh, the relative advantage of crypsis or, or, or aposematism. Uh, we conclude that aposematic strategy should be advantage when uh, other aposematic prey are common and when light levels are low and when the predator community is uh, um, less competitive. Uh, 
So we hope altogether these results um, answer to some degree the question of whether camouflage or anti-Semitism is a more effective strategy in, in different locations, illuminating its uh, global diversity and, and uh, distribution. Uh, so I want to finish just by recognizing a really fantastic collaborative network. It's been a lot of fun uh, designing this project from the very early stages with a group of, of, of global researchers. Uh, I particularly want to shout out my co-leads on this project, Alice Exner over at Charles University in Prague and Ileana Medina at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Olivia Panaccio led a lot of the in image analysis. Uh, Clara Dankova led on the quantification of left doctrine colour and Canada's own Tom Sherratt provided invaluable statistical support. So thanks everyone for listening and I hope to have a little time for questions. I, that means I don't have time for questions, right? I do? Oh, wonderful. Any questions? Mm. So, are you planning to do this now, adding unpalatability? I mean, what would be the prediction here? How would it affect Yeah, we, 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 so, we, so, we, so we ran uh, the experiment with unpalatable prey. Always nice to have a slide for, for a question. <laughs> and you can see that the, uh, the, the predation rates uh, are, are very low on, on all treatments when, when, when they're uh, unpalatable. Um, predators do start eating the cryptic prey a little bit, but. Um, yeah, it makes it very hard when, when predation rates are so low to infer any differences between treatments. Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, the details, we put 90 prey out on a random tree each day uh, and remove them when they were predated, and then remove the whole lot at the end of each day and put up a, a, a fresh population of prey. Yeah. Uh, so this is regarding the manner in which the, the, the target, the mark was set. So do you know about, let's say, the, number, the percentage of uh, cryptic species of moth and like the cryptic and hybrid species that are present over there? Yeah, so there's fairly strong geographic patterns in, 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 in the prevalence of aposematic and, and, and cryptic moths. So, uh, you know, it's very well known and well evidenced by all the people doing uh, projects on Heliconius and pepper moth butterflies that uh, they're much more common in the neotropics. Um, so this relates to some of the latitudinal patterns in, 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 in um, prey communities, but... Uh, I'm out of time, I think, so yeah, thanks. We can chat afterwards, so. <laughs>